I'll start with three theses. First is that Europe is dying. Second, Greece is the future of Europe. And third, 2011 was a very long year. It is still taking place right now. 2011 started in 2008, keeping to Western Europe, in the great insurrection in Athens, where young people over two weeks basically ruled the center of Athens. The police were not there. People uh, and young people occupied some 800 schools, not just in Athens, all over Greece, and basically acquired a huge sense of freedom that was then repeated, and we have lots of evidence of that, in Tahrir Square and in the Indignados and the, um, of course, Syntagma Square occupations. So that 2011 started in 2008, 2010 we had North Africa, 2011 we had Puerto del Sol, Athens and so on, in 2012 we had the beginning of the fight back now, even in parliamentary terms, with the amazing victory of Syriza in the uh, last elections uh, in May 6. And the response, when I say Europe is dying, the response of the uh, leadership of the European Union and of Germany was precisely to try and terrorize the Greek people not to go to the left. And you had there, in the activities before the elections, even more so, a direct use of the politics of fear to stop that movement towards the left. But to link it with the question of democracy, my argument is that without what happened in 2008 in the Athens insurrection, without the indignados and the agonactismen in Syntagma Square in 2011, Syriza would not have won the way it did and would not have the prospect, as it now has, to form the first ever radical left government in Western Europe ever. <laughs> What do I mean by that? And linking it with the idea of democracy. Democracy, as you all know, is the kratos, the force or the power of the demos. But the demos is not the people in the general sense that people understand it. The demos is precisely the rule of those who do not have the competence or ability or wealth or power or wisdom to rule. The demos in classical Athens was precisely both the whole population of Athens, but also those who were excluded. And when the demos asked to be included and to become the rulers in classical Athens, they asked for two things. First of all, that everyone and anyone should become part of ruling, but also that the excluded, those who did not have those standard qualifications to rule, should become rulers. So we have in democracy, in that idea of democracy, of direct democracy as it is being discussed here, those two aspects, everyone and anyone and the excluded. In other words, in terms of contemporary politics, that kind of democracy asks for two types of strategies, two types of approaches and political interventions. One is what we would call a conflictual intervention in favor of those who are excluded, who are invisible to the political system, and therefore they do not have any particular stake in what is happening in the country, and that was the case of the insurrections of the Athens 2008, that kind of acting out with certain violent uh, explosions in it. But then secondly, you need also the hegemonic block, the hegemonic policy that will find within the social body certain key, uh, key uh, divisions, dividing lines, and therefore build a popular block against the block of uh, the uh, economic and powerful elites. And to that extent, when I say that the squares voted for Syriza, and Syriza's victory would not have happened without the squares, I mean two things, and perhaps there I, I will finish, and then if you want the more theoretical stuff, I can say it later. When the youth, the excluded, invisible youth of Athens, and currently, and of Greece, Currently, over 50% of 18 to 25 years old 
are unemployed and unemployable. This is what one could call a genocide, not genocide, the killing of a whole generation. It happens in Spain, it happens all over Europe, but of course Greece and Spain are the key things. When these people, in a conflictual, acting out way, in an immediate uh, activity out in the streets, in a sense said, we don't want this or that, we don't want this right or the other right, we want the right to have rights. We want a reorganization and rearrangement of the uh, of the political and of the social system and a political recognition, they had to become and they did become conflictual and even violent. So that was the first kind of immediate and acting out and even violent activity which brought those invisible into the political system and to do that it had to change the rules of visibility, what it means to be politically visible. What now the squares did were precisely to turn this first negative, this negation of the rules of visibility, of political recognition and so on, to change it from that into a demonstration. By demonstration, I mean a monstration, a coming out in public and creating the conditions of a direct democratic uh, uh, assembly and so on. Now, of course, in Hegelian terms, this is obviously the second part of was the creation of both subjectivities uh, of disobedience, but also of a political subject. As we know in Hegel, the first move of the subject is a saying no, enough is enough. The second is to go out in the world, to go out in the world and present to the world our own personality, our own activity, and get that monstration, that recognition. That happens in the square, and the third, uh, the third step, which is the coming back again after going out in the world through the agency of a political uh, a coalition of political parties, which then claims precisely the creation of the completed political subject. To that extent, direct democracy, in my understanding of the term, is neither just for squares and being together and debating and arguing and deciding and acting as a multitude, important as that is, it is that plus the acceptance that eventually political subjectivity has also to pass, particularly if you're interested in taking over the state, as is the case in, in Greece and in many other uh, countries where the left is strong, to act through a political agency so that to complete the transformation of society. So what is happening here is a combination of those types of direct democratic activity that create subjectivities that are now to a certain extent free, emancipated from the biopolitical type of capitalism, which told us that the only principle in life in the 90s and the early 2000s is to consume. Well, if every I want becomes I have a right to this something. That idea that through debt, through consumption, the big existential question do I want an iPhone or a Nokia? That kind of activity was changed in the squares. It was changed through the disarticulation of the consuming subjectivity of neoliberal capitalism and then through the completion in the political process, which however is precisely a completion and companion of that part of direct democracy which created the precondition for the victory of Syriza and the radical left we can now see, perhaps for the first time in Europe, the movement towards a, a proper left and radical left government. So in my mind, while those two traditions, the democratic tradition and the representative tradition, are absolutely not identical, for the largest part of history they were actually conflictual. What we have now, for the first time in 200 years, realized is that the bringing back of direct democracy, rather than being just opposed, antagonistic to parliamentary politics of the left, can precisely create both the political individual subjectivities, but also the political subject that can change the world. Costas, phenomenal. Thanks a lot.